Hello, book two. It was mighty warm this morning, but I went back to the Brattle Bookshop anyway. <laughs> the Brattle Bookshop, those of you who are new to the channel, is a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston, and it is fantastic. The turnover rate is enormous. There is always something new to see there. I've been going there forever and ever and ever. And uh, recently, thanks to the loosening of pandemic restrictions here in Massachusetts, they reopened. So I was able to go for the first time in months, and I have been going regularly. <laughs> I went the first time that they were open, the first day that they were open, I went the three days in a row. I have since regained a modicum of control over myself so that I'm not going every day. But I went this morning, even though, even by early morning, it was already uncomfortably warm and close. And that's just made worse by wearing a mask. Um, but I went anyway, and I found a bunch of stuff, and I want to show them to you. But the first thing I want to show you is not from the Brattle. It's from a random walk outside with my dog when I came across a box on somebody's garden wall of free books. And I, even though I am surrounded on all sides here at Hyde Cottage by books, I always look in such boxes. I always poke around in them. And I found The Ill-Earth War by Stephen R. Donaldson, book two in the first Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever. Uh, the sequel to Lord Fowl's Bane, that was the beginning of this fantasy series and that wasn't all that good. I read Lord Files Bane when it first came out. I reread it a couple of times since then. We did a read along last year. Uh, and I like it just fine. It was straight up derivative Tolkien fantasy fiction. But The Ill Earth War had a lot more going on in it than that book did. I fell in love with it right away and despite the what we now call problematic elements of it, I've loved it ever since. There are huge set pieces in this book that I've never seen done better in fantasy fiction. Uh, and I have copies of this, but I, it was, it was this cover and it was this edition. It was the only one that weren't, there weren't other volumes. So I grabbed it and I not only grabbed it, but I reread chapters of it totally uncalled for. But then we have, uh, books I got at the Brattle and I, I'm just going to go through them with you. And the first one is a great big anthology of American murder mystery stories spanning a century and more uh and i the beginning of 2020 i was popping down murder mysteries short stories and novels popping them down and it looked like it was going to be a mystery heavy year for me and then something about the a worldwide deadly pandemic just sort of dimmed that it's slowly coming back but i noticed at the beginning of 2020 that my interest shifted from binging on mysteries to binging on science fiction and it's now starting to even out again so when i saw this anthology i grabbed it it's uh the norton the oxford book of american detective stories and it's edited by uh tony hillerman who with an assist by rosemary herbert uh i don't particularly like the cover but it's a great big generous thing that goes back a long way and hillerman's introduction starts in a fantastic way i want to read you just the beginning of it uh 25 years ago, when I was a first novelist on, my, on a visit to my editor, I had the occasion to read the galley proofs of, of A Catalog of Crime, now a Bible of the detective fiction genre. My editor, who was also editing the catalog, was called away to deal with another problem. The author of the catalog was due to pick up his proofs, I was told. Why didn't I take a look to see if my book had made it into the volume? It's not, Catalog of Crime is not an, an anthology of fiction. It's, it's a, an overview of practitioners of fiction. I found on page 20, I found his, he, Hillman finds his book on page 247. The author had recommended, quote, less routine plots and said that, quote, unbelievable feats of survival and retaliation by people badly wounded and hemorrhaging make the reader impatient. He read this about himself. Uh, I checked the title page to find the author of this affront, Jacques Barzun. I knew the name, a giant of the humanities, former dean and provost of Columbia University and the author of The House of the Intellect and other weighty books. Until then, I had no idea that he was also an eminent critic of detective fiction. In fact, I knew almost nothing about my field. My ignorance was quickly dented. Barzoom arrived to collect his galleys and sense from my sullen expression that he hadn't approved my work. In the ensuing conversation, I first learned that the game I had been playing had rules many of which I had violated. The point of the anecdote is the purpose of this anthology. And there you go. So you're off to the races with a bunch of his selections going back all the way to the beginning of American Detective Fiction. I don't know. I didn't check the, uh, the table of contents to see whether or not he commits the cardinal anthologist's sin uh, and includes himself, <laughs> but I'm hoping not. Uh, then this next one is a booktube buy. 
distinct category of books for me and I suspect for a lot of you as well where you might have read something in this case I had read it I read it when it first came out and recommended it and you put it away or you lose track of it and you don't have a copy and then you see it come up on booktube and suddenly you want to revisit it and that happened to me I saw this book on uh, the channel of Sean the book maniac and he had dipped his toe into it who knows if he's if he's bailed on it yet but he dipped his toe into it and liked what he's found and this is Mark Merlis. This is American Studies, his debut novel. I just found it at the Brattle for all of these things were dirt cheap. They were all in the bargain section. So, uh, and, and this is a, a, a story, the story of a man who has nothing to do except remember his gay past. He is, he is bedridden. He is uh, all the tumblers, all the, all the, the, the uh, factors in his life are temporarily trending against him. All he has to do all he can do with his time is look back on his past. Uh, not the kind of novel that you would expect a 40-something writer to write. I mean, Mark Merlis was just basically a boy, when, or a, a very young man when he wrote this, but I remember it being tremendously impressive, just tremendously. I think it made the list, my list, for that year. This came out in 1994, I think. Uh, yeah, 1994. Uh, in Sean's video where he where he held this up uh, and talked about dipping into it, he mentions this author's another book by this author, An Arrow's Flight, which is a, a quasi myth retelling of Homer, set against a backdrop and read through a prism of gay life. And uh, Sean <laughs> hilariously in his video said he doesn't want anything to do with myth retellings; doesn't have any patience for them whatsoever. If you do. If you do have patience for myth retellings, an arrow's flight is great. So you will, if you if you don't mind that, if it's not a bug boo of yours, you will love it. Uh, but you'll love this too. I I'm I'm gonna rejoice at the idea of of rereading this, especially since I've been prompted a little by BookTube to do it. Uh, the next one is an author who will need no introduction. Sorry, I've got these things on my lap and they're flopping all over the place. Uh, the author will need no introduction, but a lot of you might not be as familiar as. I am with the fact that this author wrote nonfiction as well as fiction. All, everybody knows Daphne du Maurier as the author of Rebecca and Jamaica Inn and a bunch of other novels, but she also wrote very respectable nonfiction. I've recommended a couple of those volumes on this channel in earlier videos. This one I don't think I've ever talked about. This is Golden Lads, Sir Francis Bacon, Anthony Bacon, and their friends. And where am I ever going to find this except at the Brattle? I'm never going to find this anywhere except at the Brattle. And I haven't read it in forever. In fact, I don't want to date myself, but I have a feeling I haven't read it since it first came out. So when was that? 1960s? 1975. Good Lord. <laughs> okay, so it's well due for... I mean, she's not a scholar. Uh, not not in the sense of a lot of the the uh, Elizabethan and Jacobean stuff that I have here that's done by academic scholars who do nothing else. But I think that works in her favor because she never forgets to entertain. She never forgets she's supposed to be an interesting writer. And a lot of academics do, so I, it's going to be great to revisit this. Uh, this next one is a bit of troublemaking, but it's my kind of troublemaking. I love this subject. And this is by uh, Joseph Sobran, and it's called Alias Shakespeare. Solving the Mystery of the Shakespearean Authorship Controversy. I found another one of these books at the Brattle just recently, just since they reopened. So I imagine these all came from the same person. And I double-checked to make sure, and they, that person was not me. <laughs> I mark my books as they come through my hands, and this one was never mine. Uh, but I also checked, and I don't have it. So I'm, I, if, I, if I, I have two of these things now that I've gotten the last three weeks, that they're great for binge reading. You just read a bunch of them. And that helps also to lay their arguments right on the surface. If you're, if you're reading a bunch of them in a row, then you can see the notes that, are, that recur, the documentary evidence or lack thereof that the authors note first, second, and third. It, it's uncharitable in one way because you get to see who's, let's just say, writing their book with the other guy's book open in front of them. Uh, but you also it's also interesting in a way because you get to see which pieces of evidence or lack thereof are attracting these authors. I think it's fantastic. I, uh, I, I just love the subject. Uh, I, like, I like what it brings out in its authors too. Uh, then this next one is a big fat biography, and we might want to uh, come up with an excuse to get Martine out of the room. <laughs> this, this is Charles Moore. This is part two of his magisterial three-part biography of Margaret Thatcher. This is really the pinnacle of her power, uh, all the way to the Falkland Islands War. And I, uh, looking back on this trilogy, I think it's just magnificent. 
just an incredible scholarly achievement and also an incredible literary achievement. It's an amazing work of literature as well. Truly biography at, wrought at its highest level. Uh, and I have the third volume. I reviewed the third volume, but I, I don't, I, I, when I put the third volume, I was trying to put it on the shelf next to Downing Street Memoirs. I didn't have, I realized I didn't have this one. I'm not so much interested in the first volume, well done as it was, but I want this one. So when I saw it at the Brattle, I grabbed it. <laughs> uh, this next one, a fascinating figure. This is one of those authors whose life was at least as interesting as anything she ever wrote. Although she was a trailblazer. We think of, you think of uh, espionage novels, spy novels, international thriller novels. You think almost, I'd be willing to bet that when you think of that field of fiction, you think only of men. And this woman was writing really good, interesting, intelligent books on that subject for decades, long before a lot of her more famous male counterparts were doing that. This is Helen McGuinness. This particular book is The Venetian Affair. And I confess, part of the reason I got it is part of the reason that I originally read it. I think this came out in the early 1960s. Uh, I read it when it first came out. I, was, I never missed a Helen McGuinness when they came out. Um, 1963. Part of the reason that I did this is because I love the city of Venice. I've visited it many times. I've also lived there. And I, it doesn't take much more than putting Venice in the title of a book for me to be interested in reading it. But this is also fascinating. It's a Cold War thriller, and it's ripped from the headlines, and it lives in the politics of the day. It's very intelligent, very well done. Uh, Helen McInnes was the wife of the classicist Gil Hyatt who wrote, uh, some of you will know his book, Poets in a Landscape, and he wrote a bunch of other things, too. He has a couple of books in the little book room. Uh, Poets in a Landscape is in there. It's absolutely indispensable volume, just wonderful. But also, he has, there are a couple of collections of his literary reviews that are in there as well. And he and Helen McGinnis were, their story is fascinating. I wish somebody would write a story of her life and, and include a lot of his, because they lived a lot of the adventures that, they, that she ended up writing about. Uh, but I haven't read this in literally a lifetime. So I will, I will re <laughs> there's our author. I will reinforce the cover uh, and then gladly dive back in because it's been so long, it'll basically be new. And while I was on the Venice binge, I got another Harold Brodke book. This is Profane Friendship, uh, a novel of his about two men who conduct a, an illicit affair in the Venice of, I think, the 1930s. I haven't read this since it came out. This, was, this novel was... Uh, after The Runaway Soul, I believe. Yeah, 1994 is when this came out. And uh, I worried about it at first when I, when I first heard about it. And when I first, I remember start, when I first started, I was a little worried because part of this book was underwritten by the city of Venice. And you worry about that. <laughs> you really do. If you don't, you should. You worry that if a city underwrites a novel, that there's going to be a lot of preaching in there and that the city's not going to come off looking particularly bad. And I don't remember anything like that being an issue with this book. But it'll be fascinating to read it again. A lot of these things are, they were so cheap that I grabbed them even knowing that they don't really fit the primary goal of any used book shopping for my part, even when the books are this cheap. My primary goal is to make sure that the book ends up in the little book room, not out here. That it's a keeper, in other words, forever, not just for a season. And not a lot of these probably are. Probably a lot of what I've shown you so far I will not keep forever. The Margaret Thatcher I will but probably not a lot of these others. Uh, but I'm always on, on the hunt. I, these are so cheap that I don't, I don't care. I'll reread them and really enjoy them. They will be my rereads for a whole week, and I will be perfectly happy with that. Uh, but I mentioned uh, keepers because I'm always on the lookout for them, and that's part of why I, I read so many literary reviews, because these are authors who are presumably on the same hunt for books of permanent interest. One of the literary views that's most interested in books of permanent interest is the London Times Literary Supplement, the TLS. And I recently showed you an issue that was a con that had a concentration on E.M. Forster. Uh, some long think pieces that were very good. I ended up reading and pulling them. They were they were very entertaining. And as is always true when the TLS does a theme like that, they finished it up with a piece from their archives, a brief piece from their archives. In this case, written by A.S. Byatt. It was a review from 30 years ago, something more than 30 years ago, 1986. It was a review from 1986 of E.M. Forster's Commonplace book, uh, which had been published by his estate, where, where authors often do this, readers often do this, maybe you do it yourself, where in addition to a journal or anything like that, you also keep a commonplace book of quotes that have come to your mind. 
authors do it a lot or used to do it a lot because they could use it as a quarry for epigraphs, raw material, stuff like that. Uh, and also because authors really can't help it. Authors are magpies by nature. Uh, I don't know that many authors that keep commonplace books anymore. I think keeping commonplace books may have died out. Uh, but I knew that Foster had one. I think I'd even come across it once upon a time, but I don't think I'd ever studied it or read it. I love Auden's commonplace book, for instance. Uh, but I read, I reread the A.S. Byatt review, and then I pulled it. You can see I pulled it, and I, I clipped the edges so it's nice and clean. And I, I, when I was pulling the other Forster things, I pulled this one. I thought, well, okay, I have the Furbank biography of E.M. Forster, a great biography of E.M. Forster. So I will just put all this stuff in that biography. It doesn't, they don't have to go anywhere else they, they they're forced to relate it that's good enough for me so i pulled this out and put it on a pile of reviews that i'm going to rehome that i'm going to put in books once the pile gets big enough so that it's falling over and but I, when i was at the brattle i found forster's commonplace book i found the actual book that is reviewed by as by it so this i can show you what's going to happen this is going to go right in here <laughs> so, so this is exactly where it belongs i want this book absolutely so uh, that's an, a great advantage of, of the Brattle Bookshop is that you never know what you're going to find. And that definitely applies to the last book that we have to look at. The find of the day uh, is this big illustrated thing. It's mostly written by Ronald Rood. Uh, it's uh, Vermont Life was a magazine dedicated to the natural and farming and beauty of the state of Vermont here in the United States. And this is Vermont Life's Book of Nature. Uh in which Ronald Rood, uh, most of his stuff is reprinted here. He did a reg he did regular nature walking columns for Vermont Life forever, and this is a big, beautiful thing. It's got uh, color photography, it's got black and white photography, and it's also absolutely liberally laced. There's the notorious Fisher Cat of Vermont. It's laced all throughout with illustrations by Robert Candy, everywhere, just everywhere, illustrations by him plus black and white photos, and an inset of color photos, uh, all detailing, all meant to illustrate Ronald Rood's uh, essays about various animals, various natural times and seasons in Vermont. But he also gets help. You can see on the cover that the introduction is by Hal Borland, who has an American natural history book that is actually in the little book room. It's so good. And there's also a couple of pieces here by Edwin Wade Teal, who I've mentioned on this channel, uh, and also uh, George Aiken. Who does a couple of pieces for he did a couple of pieces for Vermont Life on wildflowers, on identifying them, their curious nature, growing them, cultivating them, that sort of thing. And George Aiken was not just a horticultural expert, although I believe he was president of the Vermont Horticultural Society in his day. But he wasn't just that. He was also governor of Vermont and then became a Republican senator from Vermont forever. He was in the Senate for like 30 years. Uh a wonderful guy, a, a real a real antidote to the current political climate in the United States. I saw a sign on uh, uh, I saw a picture of a sign on Twitter that was in front of a polling place somewhere in the American Midwest that had two color banners, and it's it had open check boxes and it said, "Who are you voting for this year?" And the two the two different colored banners with the open check boxes were Democrat or Nazi. And that wasn't always true. Once upon a time, Republicans weren't frothing at the mouth insane. They, and, and Aiken was a perfect example of that. Just a, a terrific figure on the American political scene for a long time and very responsibly. Uh, so it's going to be, not that the politics enter into it, they don't enter into it at all, but it's going to be great fun to read his contributions to this book again. I don't think I have ever read him on Wildflowers, so we shall see. Uh, and this has a lot, most of this is Ronald Rood, and he's terrific, writing about uh, birds, owls, uh, black bears, uh, fisher cats. He mentions, I believe, I remember from his, his essay on black bears that he says that seasoned men of the woods in Vermont have gone their whole lives without seeing a black bear. And yet, Vermont is full of black bears, so it's, it's just a, a matter of chance, a matter of you surprising one of them, something like that. But, but that walking through the woods in Vermont is almost guaranteed to be a bear-free experience. Now, there are people who can testify otherwise, but, but it was great fun to find this. And when I pulled it off the shelf in the sale lot at the Brattle, I thought of Mark Richardson at Richardson Reads, who is 
Vermont to his eyeballs, <laughs> who lives up in Vermont, is the library director up in Vermont. And I was looking, I was looking at this and thinking, ah, oh, well, that's a natural thing to just put on a pile of books to bring up to to Vermont when you go back up to the little farmhouse. The pandemic has stopped that for a while, but it's bound to resume. And then I started looking through this at how how beautifully done it is, how beautifully illustrated it is. And after a while, look at that. This is on the bogs of Vermont. After a while of looking at the artwork and reading some of the essays, I started thinking, Mark, who? <laughs> so, so I may keep this. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> or or a, exact a heavy trading price for it and something of his. But anyway, there you go. That is a rather warm trip to the brattle <laughs> that, we, that I did this morning. I don't think I'll be going back until the weather breaks. This has been a, a string of really hot, close days. Uh, just fine for going there. It's fine for shopping there, but it's not so great for coming back. So... I may, I may hold off on the brattle for, for the rest of the week. We shall see. Unsettled weather is in, is in the, the forecast for the next few days. Maybe that will decrease the barbarousness of the, of the weather. And then I'll go back. I'll, you'll be the first to know either way. So I'm going to wrap this up, but I will be back. Thank you, Book 2.